Hello there, my fellow hopeless romantics. Oh, you lovesick dreamers. I am one third of the dynamic power trio of truly epic proportions. My name is Zach, and I am joined by my co-host and the incredibly beautiful, insanely talented love of my life, Brittany. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Matrimony Money, an epic love podcast as we endeavor to see through the veil of illusion of mendacity and we rediscover the magic of a world pregnant with true love hiding below the hollow facade. We're exploring the nature of love here, what it is from a million different angles, approaches, tones, to weave a complexly blossoming pattern of love, but hopefully from a new angle, maybe with a little more authenticity or even touching upon some taboo themes. And most importantly, we feel somewhat qualified to speak on the nature. Well, there are many reasons, but one important one is that we are in the business of love. That's right. We are wedding filmmakers and Brittany is a wedding hair. Oh, I'm a wedding hair and makeup lady. That's right. And uh, this is our first episode. And we are fading the music. That's the spot. And so for this first inaugural episode... A special little treat here. We did something kind of fucked up. Uh oh. And we watched a mind blowing, in my opinion, thematically relevant film, Magnolia, and we haven't talked about it yet. No, we haven't talked about it since we, it's really hard for me when you get to know me. I don't hold anything in. So we had a rule, Zach's rule, like, do not talk. After you watch this, I've been holding my breath for 30 minutes while we re-recorded this intro because it was, I was shocked. It was a pretty crazy film. It's a three and a half hour long epic from the 90s, kind of about the theme of love. And at least for me, it was pretty central and many things, including this, the wedding business that, that we share. Yeah. I mean, when relating it to weddings, I never... I guess I wasn't thinking about that when I was watching it. Well, I'm I, so kind of thinking about this as a podcast about love and telling stories of love mm. and from all the different angles that, that, uh, that love manifests. And I feel like there's a lot of pain in that film mm, yeah, and trauma. But for me, it's about love and it's like a teaching film for me. It always has been. Yeah, that... That resonates with me. I would say it's the part of love I've been hiding from. It's the the dark side that I still judge as horrible and painful. And you don't really get that rom-com, touchy, feel-good feeling that, you know, you kind of get touched in the wrong place a little bit, you know? <laughs> and, and, but that's the no-no place. The no-no place. This was a no-no place love, literally. And, um... I just did not want to relate to this as much as I did. Yeah, I um, to give a little bit of a backstory, really quickly. Brittany knows this, but you all don't know really about my story at all or Brittany's story. So, mm-hmm. but this was a formative film for me, and a reason why I'm in like the wedding business, and for you know simply the reason that like had I not seen this when I was 20 years old. And had my, you know, like, world turned upside down, I wouldn't have gone to film school. I was a business guy struggling at University of Michigan. And I'd seen this film and watched it several times in theaters. And, like, as a kid, I was very into filmmaking and then fell away from it in high school like a rebellious teenager usually does and was interested in making a lot of money in business and got to University of Michigan and overwhelmed with all the really smart kids trying to get into the B school and 
because there was a, a, a film class that I took as a prerequisite that had Magnolia on the syllabus, I took that class and ended up switching my majors because of this genius who kind of tore the film apart, talked about it for really like my favorite film at that time. And I switched majors and went and got a film degree and had been kind of inspired by that my whole life. But like more importantly, I feel like than that, it taught me a lot about cyclical family trauma that I've been through personally and um, ways to kind of try to see that, heal from that and embrace true love. So that's my real quick story about... Um, what Magnolia sort of did for me. But real quick, I just want to say before we actually get into this, if you have not seen Magnolia, spoiler alert, um, and you don't want spoilers in this one, please go and watch the film. So, okay, we're back in. And again, I'm going to actually start from the... T so we we'd actually just lost a whole bunch of, I thought, really great stuff because we're... Rookie's here doing this podcast, but we're going to try to recreate what we literally just didn't record. Sadly. You guys missed, while I was describing the blowjob I just gave him and the experience he had, but it's all gone now. All the, the beautiful vulnerability. All the seedy yeah. details of that brilliant <laughs> cock-waxing blowjob. <laughs> I don't know if this is, is this, is this uh, epic love, matrimony, money friendly? <laughs> I, I think so. I think blowjobs are a huge part of marriage and magnolia and everything we're talking about right now. It seems so I don't relevant. even know if we got to the point of we did. Okay, we did. We, we said there's spoilers. That's where we were at. So real quick, we're going to do a synopsis because I was a male asshole that actually we were getting right into the vulnerability and then I decided to interrupt it by talking about a bunch of intellectual structural shit about this film. I don't even know really. So like, I think quickly, um, let's do the synopsis, which is Magnolia is a deconstructed family melodrama set in San Fernando Valley, um, on Magnolia Boulevard. Um, with all these male, patriarchal, um, powerful men sort of in Hollywood that have been passing down generational trauma, toxic masculinity through the generations, abusing women and um, children and... Um, I don't think it's any mistake that it's it's about the media. We we saw some things come to light recently, um, within the last seven years or so, with the media. So, but I think more more importantly, this is a, a, about it's like a tapestry of Americana and American trauma that gets passed down from generation to generation. So there's all these characters that are passing this down. I mean, that's the the quick the quick synopsis. Yeah, it's just passed down generation, generation. You see the cause and effect of the trauma and how it affects or affects. Is it affects? Mm -hmm. He's the word Nazi. Yeah, it affects <laughs> Sorry, their lives. And, and as it's passed down, they hate their father for what their father did, but they became the same monster or they shut down and had no life at all. So because of the resentments and holding on to the past, so it was really um, such a crazy film. Like me personally, and I know Zach, um, relating to it um, and how our lives have been affected. I think millennials, I think the millennials, in my opinion, were the feeling creatures put in an, into a non-feeling world. And we didn't know how to belong here because we were punished for feeling. But I think men in particular, the reason why they've become these monsters, not all men, but I don't think anyone's a monster at their core. I think everyone's beautiful. And they became this way because they were punished for vulnerability and, and being able to speak that vulnerability and that emotion. So suppressed emotion leads to 
child molestation leads to cheating, leads to hiding secrets, leads to having the bitch wife at home. I, I relate to being that bitch wife because I can't get that connection with you. So we scream and we stomp and we're mean, but the men can't do it because they've been told they can't. And, you know, there's so many different points in this movie. That was just one perspective that really stuck out to me amongst many. And then really quickly, just to set it up, because I don't think this was on the original recording, I, I told my story with the film, and then I'm going to ask you sort of your experience, having watched it emotionally. Um, for me, watching this film as a young 20-year-old man, um, I'd started out, and this is partly why this is relevant, in my opinion, for our inaugural episode. Um, I watched this at a time in my life when... Um, I was just sort of coming to an awareness of what I didn't like about being a man and what I was ashamed of to be a man. And it really not only spoke to me in that way, but it was also just such a powerful film that moved me in ways that like I hadn't been moved since I was a youngster. I'd sort of got away from film and loving film. As a kid, I would make, I was, you know, making films with all the neighborhood kids and got away from it in my 20s, embraced business, was trying to get into University of Michigan Business School, got there, it was crazy, decided to take this film class because Magnolia was on the syllabus and that had messed me up so thoroughly that I was like, I gotta take this just as a prerequisite. And because business school is so overwhelming, I just like was like, I'm, I love, I love what this professor is inspiring me to think about by talking about my favorite film in that way. And it sort of led me along a path of that's why I got my film degree and that's why I'm making wedding films today because I got that film degree. And so that's the importance of, one of the importance of, of, the, of this film relating to this podcast about love. But more importantly, I, th I think it is a film about love and I think it's a film about, that, that forced me to sort of at a time in college when I was like questioning my own masculinity, my own male lineage of trauma that had been passed down for generations and generations and that was inside of me even though I wasn't manifesting it physically. I felt that the pull to that womanizing sort of force that was sort of lurking in my lineage and many, I think many men probably have these cycling traumas that of, of unconfronted, of unconfronted trauma really that they passed down to the the next generations. And so for me, I was, I had mentioned this before about like going on the trip with my father right after college. And I had, I was rejecting my masculinity probably mostly because of this film, what that put on my, you know, put it on my radar as sort of men are bad. That's what I felt. And I felt that like, I'm a man and I don't want to be a man. And I was sort of rejecting my masculinity, saw the suit like the psychic in Sedona Subasini, she said that um, I need to become, I am a man, and men aren't um, necessarily evil, and that I needed to draw my boundaries and become a warrior of what I thought was good um, in masculinity, and a warrior doesn't have to fight for um, nefarious means and can sort of be a warrior for positivity. And so then I started sort of that journey of confronting these traumas inside of myself, these masculine wounds, um, and I'm still I'm still struggling with it to this day. And then I'm curious what this film was like emotionally for you. I, I know we did this one time. Well, I have some questions about what yeah. you said, though. Yeah. yeah. So you Sorry. you struggled when you denied being a man. What is that? You denied is did you shut down? You decide not to date, like when you say. I, I know that I I sexually felt ashamed to animalistically be masculine um, in a way, and 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 I thought sex would, had to be this like very loving, almost like feminine thing, and so I wasn't very good at sex. I wasn't very like tapped into my animal masculinity. I was very ashamed of it, and I think I became a lot more in touch with my feminine side at that time, and and really. Not like I wanted to be gay or anything. It was more like I was relating with my creative, nurturing part of myself and, and sort of wasn't really healthy by, 
in the way that I, I was just like rejecting all that. It wasn't like I was connecting with who I was in a deeper way. So I just think there's all kinds of other problems that c can come about when you're a man that like doesn't know how to be a man, doesn't have, know how to be a feeling masculine man. Yeah. It's if you don't gonna, have a model. It's going to lead in, and that's totally it. Cause if any males can relate out there to what Zach just said, a lot of times from, from what I've noticed is males who don't feel safe in what I call the false masculine of what you guys have been told you should be as a male. Don't, you know, talk your, speak your feelings and stuff like that. What happens is when you completely reject that, your body gets so ridden with anxiety and you feel so unsafe because you don't feel safe because you're not using that masculine energy to protect yourself and provide for yourself. So it's a lot of, you don't ever feel protected in your body suit. And you'll hear us talk about body suits a lot. Uh, that's, that's what we are. It's these body suits. Meat Go, suits. Meat suits. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I would say my experience with this film um, brought up a lot of emotions. I kind of, just based on um, Zach set me up for this film, it was so important to him, and I could tell. He was so, so excited, like, for me to see it, and it was so sweet. So I, I kind of, like, had my poker face on, like, yeah, yeah, this is cool. Sure, sure, I'll watch it. But I knew it was really important to him. I actually, deep down, was super excited, but I didn't want to... I don't know why. I don't want to show him the vulnerability because I um, have rejected that feminine side within myself. I think that I have felt I've had to be a man for myself because I haven't trusted men because of the way I view men. And I didn't know this about myself because on the surface I'd say men are great, but it's because I was walking around as one essentially because I didn't feel I could be protected by one. I didn't let them. But I rejected my feminine side, which is soft and receptive and all these things because it felt unsafe to be a woman. So watching this movie was crazy to me because it painted a picture that I felt guilty admitting within myself about how I view males. They scare the shit out of me. Um, Zach scares the shit out of me. Um, they all scare the shit out of me. And it's not because I'm afraid they're going to hit me. Not like that. It's more, I don't feel safe with them. Emotionally. Emotionally. And this film um, with Claudia, mm -hmm. I related to her the most, I would say. Um, having this patriarch father who um, you end up finding out he molested her as a child and she never got vindicated for it with truth that it happened um, until right before he died. Um, but for me, I, I always feel guilty for saying, oh, my dad did this, or my, um, my granddad did this to my dad, so my dad did this behavior to me. I always justified it. So I've suppressed my stepdad was horrible to us, to me and my brother, and I've always justified it. Well, hurt people hurt people. And so the past few weeks, what I've noticed, and this is going to get back to the film, by the way, what I've noticed is all this shame, being in this relationship with Zach, a man who's probably one of the safest men I've ever been around, I can't trust it, though. And Claudia related to this in the movie with um, the police officer. What's his name? Jim Curring. Jim Curring. It's like, she's like, can we just be honest and upfront? Okay, are you going to love me? Okay, she's just like checking. She's like, are you safe? Are you safe? Are you safe? Are you safe? And I just started feeling all this anger I've, because like, I've been healing. And right now at the surface for me is shame and anger at all those motherfuckers that I felt guilty for blaming because I know resentment holds us back. But now I'm fucking mad at them. All the men out there. And I don't want to stay in this, but I need to get this out. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you for hurting a little girl. Like, fuck you. I don't care if you were hurt. Like, I have so much trauma. And then, you know, it's on the millennials and these black sheep to fucking release it. And I don't want to release it, much like the Tom Cruise character and all the ones. It's like, fuck you, dad. Fuck you, because I don't feel safe in this body. Fuck you. You look down on me now because... I'm mentally ill off and on in my life because I'm this feeling creature that hasn't been allowed to feel. 
I've been shamed for it. I've been told I was crazy. Um, and I logically want to justify their behavior a lot like these characters in the movie. So I just really connected to the children in this movie that were hurt by their fathers. And I was angry. And I've been, this anger though, just like those characters has manifested through me and my current relationship with my children and my partner, Zach. Everything he says, I'm looking for something to punish him constantly because I'm like, he's gonna hurt me, he's gonna hurt me, he's gonna cheat on me, just like the fathers in that movie. He's gonna cheat on me, I don't give a fuck what he says. He's gonna hurt me, he's unsafe. He's gonna be a misogynist who, who's gonna degrade me in some way or another in the future. I'm never gonna find out, just like the women in this film, I'll find out right before he dies. And I'll find out he cheated on me, or he hurt me, and somehow there's a justification because I'm mentally ill and I'm fucked up. That's constantly in my system. He's going to be my dad. He's going to be my dad. He's going to be my dad. And I can't just turn it off. So, like, this film just really spoke to me, but also spoke about eventually we got we got to heal this or it's going to repeat. And I'm going to keep doing this to Zach, who potentially could be someone, because he reminds me of that character. Jim Curring. Jim Curring, who is so sweet. And is just like, I just want to love you. I just want to love you unconditionally. And I'm like, fuck off. Like you're, you're enemy number one. And it's fair but based on what we've seen in this world, in this culture for so long. But it makes me hate myself. Like, and this is just real, real. It doesn't mean I should. It's not beneficial to hate myself, but it makes me hate myself when you have this sweet man across from the t table and you're just kicking and screaming and punching in your energy, like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You've all hurt me. You're just going to hurt me again. It's too, it's just, it, it always happens that way. That's how it's happened for hundreds of years. I can't believe this is true because there's no evidence. There's no evidence that it's true. So it's, it's constantly walking on water, wanting to believe that this man really could love me and not cheat on me. That if he blew, he's going to blow up, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know. And all these women are going to be after his dick. I'm terrified. I'm terrified. When we go do weddings together, this is so embarrassing. I'm constantly terrified because I'm afraid he's my dad. He's going to be my dad and he's going to be all the other men I protected myself from. I'm so scared, so I'm not. I'm pushing him away, and I'll never find out. <laughs> I'm just so scared. I'm sorry. No, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So this movie brought that out for me. The anger is labeled the shame that I've been projecting at you. It gave it a definition, and I'm so blessed that you let, you brought me to this movie. And then for me as a man, it's hard because it's easy for me to see that narrative and to feel shame as a man to be a man, even if I've never cheated, which I haven't. I feel shame to be a man. I, I have for a long time, and it's easy for me to see that narrative and for me to... And I feel like partly... Somehow that shame is preventing me from healing in some way and accepting maybe the good parts of being a man. I'm like, you know, and, 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 and preventing me from loving myself enough to be in the moment and feel in the way that would be conducive to our connection you know, like, so it's just an interesting thing. The awareness of, of it for me still hasn't allowed me to heal. And I don't know what that is. And I don't know exactly how to hug that wound. The it's shame. like a porcupine. It's like we're supposed to hug it. And it's like biting the fuck out of you while you're trying to, you know, all the little porcupine pricks trying to prick you while you're trying to hug something that physically shakes you. I've, on, I've, on, I've not only, but mostly seen examples in this culture of men that I don't trust, that I don't, that I, in the same way that you don't. Like, I, I really, that's what 
that, that partly why this movie was so affecting for me originally and I just it made me so ashamed to be a man and, and it made me feel like eventually this is my fate and you know? like I just want to speak to that and I totally understand just because like I'm now admitting my this is a new revelation I'm admitting out loud because usually I feel so guilty for saying this about men I've been such a defender of men because I felt sorry for you guys because you haven't felt safe to be the true divine masculine the true masculine feminine both leading with the masculine but being able to feel so I feel for you and I have empathy for that but the there is resentment there is build up Mm. but this is the thing I have to say about Zach is he may be afraid of that masculine all of you should be afraid of that masculine. It needs to be loved. It needs to be no longer be accepted. But that is not true masculine energy. That isn't. That's, that's a facade. True masculine energy protects his, the people he loves. It's fearful, traumatized masculinity. And that's not who you'll ever be. That's not you. You're quite the opposite. If anything, you're closer. It feels closer. like it's, it's in me, though, sometimes, you know, like just in the sense of... Not in a way for you to be afraid of, just in the way that I, because it's 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 not been safe for a man as a man for me to. I see. I'm even using depersonalizing language now, talking about myself in third person. It's not been safe for me growing up to express emotion, um, and even when I do, there's still an insecurity about being vulnerable in that way because it was so programmed into me that it wasn't safe for a man. You were going to be lowest on the pecking order. Um, is, is, you know, I was, I was raised at a time when that was still true, that, like, if men smell, smell blood, you were the weakest link in the wolf pack or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, like, that is still in me, and it's still part of, like, even now talking about the emotion. I feel my intellect talking about it. As opposed to like feeling it from a heart space. I, I don't relate know why to that. It's so hard. It's hard. Like being a mask in a false mask. And that's what I am. I, yeah, I do believe. Yeah, I relate. Yeah. I'm so heavy on logic. And, and actually, I heard a podcast on this. I think it's really interesting. Is I think the, the boomer culture before the millennials, so the, cult- the, the different generations before the millennials, we're all Before the Gen Xers, my generation, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, way back. So boomers, these were fucking boomers. Fucking boomers, man. It's all your fault. Well, but boomer, well, the thing is, it was all yeah. It was all heavily um, logic based. There wasn't a lot of feeling going on at all. It was very it wasn't allowed though. No, it wasn't allowed. So it wasn't allowed. So this is this is how it was. Then the millennials come in. And the the end of the Gen X is I the think millennials. Even some of the gener the Gen Xers yeah. were starting to try to turn the yeah, ship around. Yeah, the Gen X. Then you have um, the millennials, and then Ford. Yeah. And you have people who are feeling. Mm-hmm. And to the boomers and earlier, they're like, we we got punished a lot. The younger ones because it was like, what's wrong with you? Why are you asking those kind of questions? It just is what it is because of one plus one equals two. Mm. And we're just like, but that doesn't feel right. That hurts when you say that. The suck it up thing, that was trauma. The tough love. The tough love traumatized us because for some reason, and we can get into the woo-woo stuff later. I have some opinions on this. Little, little We're going to talk about twin flames. Ooh, and ETs and twin flames. All yeah. the woo. All the woo. But there's some woo action going on, I think, in the Indigo Children and different things like that. I love it. I love we're talking about this on the, on, a, on a wedding films podcast. I'm so all about this. Okay. No, 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 no. I love it. Yeah. I want to yeah. get, get fucking weird here. Yeah, we're definitely. I don't think we can help it. <laughs> no. But the, the, I got to get to the, like yeah. what's so ironic, ladies, is men are scared to feel because. The other wolves of the wolf pack that had penises were like, you're not a man if you feel. But like vulnerability is a panty dropper. If a male, God, if when Zach comes to me and it takes a lot of energy for him um, because it's scary as fuck for a male. But when he comes to me and goes, okay, here's the truth. I did this because I'm scared of this. This terrifies me. So I said this, 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 and this because I've been hiding from this. There is something in me that instantly softens 
instantly senses, because women were very heavily feeling safety-driven creatures, we're like, whoa, that's safe. In his vulnerability, we let go. And we become more attracted and connected to you instantly like glue. Especially you Palladians. Mm. So... Are we're we, not going there. Okay. We, we just joke that she's a Palladian. Maybe more on this later. Mm, yeah. Yeah. But um, I didn't know how woo was. We were safe to get. No, I mean we can get straight. We will not go. F- there no, for no, now. we won't. We'll go. save that. We'll we'll tease it. Yeah. We'll tease it for future episodes. Yeah. So I mean, breaking cycles and families, these traumatic cycles that you and I. I think we're relating more and more every day and I need to have more understanding with you that like it's not easy to connect being a man and it's not easy for me to feel being this protected woman. Part of the thing that it's, it's, I think it's hard to trust. You have an on for me. I mean, I see see her. We've we've outed her (laughs) on air. Uh, She is an on addict. On, brought to you by warning this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive. All you at home, please do not uh, use ons. It's a it's a nefarious. They're all over the bedroom. I like he finds them. Little surprises. It's really become cute now for me. I found disgusting. The on stuck to that water bottle or whatever it was I was (laughs) drinking. It's it's ons. Used ons are little tobacco packets for those of you who don't know. Yeah, I quit smoking years ago and I started sucking because I like to suck on these ons. And, um, only on the ons. Only on the ons. And they, there's cinnamon, they put some kind of sugar in it and I'm an addict at heart, so they, they do it for me. I can look classy and people have no idea. I got a little bit of white trash in there. Just a touch. Yeah. Just a touch of white trash, just the right amount. Yeah. Is it is that is it it's, is that cancelable to say white trash? We I can mean, talk it's about white not people, right? Probably all that um No, it's white, so we can be mean. <laughs> we have no problems with any forms of trash, including No, no, all tra- white. all colors. We we are accepting. But anyway, no, we we so, actually are very loving people. That's yeah. I think, I think that what, you were making fun of yourself. I was making, trying to do. I was not making the, fun of not myself. the white trash community. <laughs> no, we've got no, a lot of I love. Like, no, that well, that's the one thing. Like I realized, like even in this movie, like the people who've who've been through so much shit. Nice segue. <laughs> bring, it gotta, bring it back. Bring it back. We've got back. some Flow ADD jobs, going on sometimes. Stress, yeah. Nicotine. Yeah. Bring it in. Rain it uh, in, uh, babe. Uh, Rain it right in. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the people who've been through the most out there. And who've survived it. It feels like sometimes like you're going through hell. But when you see other people who, let's say, like some of these characters snorting cocaine and sleeping around and then escaping, escaping, you just see them and you instantly relate and empathize. And you're some of the least judgmental people. Um, So it's like to my white trash brothers and sisters. Bring it back. I love you. Bringing it full circle. So... (laughs) Basically, um, what I was about to say, though, as a man, one of the most confusing things is because even after all the self-awareness, the meditation, the therapy, um, like knowing the issue, knowing what I need to do, because of all the programming that's like hardwired into my nervous system from a young age over and over, it's really, even when I know the problem, it does feel like I'm victimized by it. I don't believe that I am. I know there's a way out. There's a way to level up here but it can feel like it's happening to me like I don't know how to get out of the unfeeling masculine sometimes even when I try like even when I'm getting vulnerable and talking about it now it's like I feel a wall in me that I don't know how to take down and I know there's a way you know perhaps Let's find a girlfriend who screams kicks and yells and throws a bitch fit because little Brittany I'll be like no 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 I want you to feel and then finally you get so angry you're like not you I feel you? I feel something fuck you and I then you f- I, I break open she's I break open the bridge of feeling a perfect girlfriend no <laughs> yeah I am I'm perfectly crazy <laughs> the, the past since he's Stop. moved here from Michigan 
it's it's been pretty intense. Um, we both have our demons. Let's face it. Yeah, yours are maybe louder, but mm-hmm. I think mine are more of the quiet, unemotional, detached gaslighting type. If I have a form of, and then mine's more the shaming, judgmental, loud, screaming, yelling because we both are feeling abandoned, and the more abandoned, if I'm correct, you feel you shut down more, and then the more he shuts down, the more I feel abandoned. It doesn't feel safe, so I, I detach from emotion, and she leans into emotion. Yeah, so I'm like, I feel energetically because I'm very sensitive. I'm like, he's pulling away, he's pulling away, and it feels like he's leaving energetically, and I get more and more scared, and then I go to. Um, self-preservation and I'm just like fuck you I'm out and then physically because I feel energetically he left I want to run because I'm like I'm not going to be hurt by my father again I'm not going to be hurt I'm not going to I just I can't I can't do this I get so scared and and it's like more internal minds more external we're we're always opposite I think we see all of these patterns just to bring it back to the movie Magnolia yeah. I think we see all of these patterns playing out between men and women in the film Mhm Yeah I mean it's because even when Claudia mm-hmm. I think who we both sort of Brittany, I don't know if this was on the part that we recorded or not but if it is sorry for repeating ourselves Brittany feels kind of connected or, or, or that Claudia's character is sort of similar to her, and I feel that Jim Curring, the police officer, weirdly, <laughs> is super square. Like, maybe not all of the square aspects of He him. corrects her. <laughs> he's constantly this... But, but he's sort of a good, like, father figure in a way. Like, he has a good heart. There's something hopeful about his masculinity and his willingness to, like, see that sometimes people need to be forgiven and sometimes he needs to forgive himself and sometimes he needs and he ends up being vulnerable with Claudia in a beautiful way. He does. He says, I don't want to judge the person, but unfortunately because I'm an officer of the law, I have to take action on the the things, the actual objects that have to be judged. But he didn't judge the person. He actually wanted good for everyone. But he knew there had he had to take people to jail sometimes. And some people he needed to let them have forgiveness, but ultimately he loved everybody. And yeah, he was vulnerable with her at the dinner and he admitted, you know, he probably always felt like a pussy yeah. his whole life. He probably always felt that because he was very sensitive yeah. and he wasn't like the other police officers yeah. that were just like taking people to jail and like, yeah. He was embarrassed that he lost his gun. He mm-hmm. was vulnerable about that with Claudia. And he was afraid he wouldn't be man enough for her to actually respect him because he didn't respect himself and no one respected him. And all she wanted was a safe man. She just wanted a safe man to be with that wouldn't be her dad who molested her. And it was so heartbreaking before that was confronted how she was resisting an, a good man that that really was trying for her. She couldn't even mm, yeah. sort of face her own trauma yeah, and fear. She, she just started, she was like, can we just be honest with each other? Can you just, do we really have to hide things? Mm-hmm. You know, because like both her parents and all the piss and shit. And yeah, then, can we just skip all the piss and shit? And, and then just he be honest? gets all like prudish and he's like piss and shit. Piss really? and shit. Oh, so oh he, my he god! He judges he judges her, you know, in an, an unfortunate way that he kind of immediately takes back. It broke his heart to judge her. Yeah, he was like, wait. Immediately, he. Yeah, he always wanted to protect her. I yeah. think he chose her as soon as he saw her. It's, there's something in you men. I think y'all have that. Like you. You see that woman, you're like, I want to protect her. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. know what it is about her. I don't know anything about her, but she's the one I want to protect. And, yeah. and he chose her. He didn't know she was snorting lines of cocaine in the bathroom. He actually, I think if she didn't tell him any of that stuff ever, it wouldn't have mattered to him. Yeah. He just wanted to be, he felt blessed because he thought Jesus or something sent him a woman. And he just said, I promise I won't waste this. I'll take care of her. Mm-hmm. And then he, she's had no examples of this her whole life. Yeah. And she sees it and she's terrified. She's like, there's no way. Which you can relate with. Oh my God. In, in this relationship. In Every fact. time I see him, I'm scared. And like Zach's even said, is this even healthy? Sometimes we both say that. And I'm like, I don't. I, I feel feelings of terror because it's like I don't have any evidence that this could be true. It's all blind faith. Like if you knew this man 
even when he picks things apart, because we both are OCD, he does it like this character in the movie, Jim Kerr. Kerring. Kerring. I have such a hard time. In a loving It's all way. love. Like, And when he sees it hurts me, he instantly is just like that character and goes, oh, babe, no, 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 no. Like, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I just want you to know you're like that character. You're like, it's the last thing you want to do is hurt me. And it's the first thing I want to do when you hurt me. And it's interesting because in a way he still has this tiny seed of that toxic masculinity in him that he's transcending. And that Mm. I relate with that. I relate with like, it's almost like you can't escape it completely because the culture we are raised in that fear of it's, you know, the judging is this, this wall, I think that, that you hide behind as a man, you know? Yeah. And I don't think, I think you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Like I do. Like that's part of the reason it gets so big inside. And I think I want to escape my body because I'm like, there's so much shame wanting to be projected at the person I say I love. I want to hurt him so bad sometimes and punish him because he terrifies me. And then I hate myself for, for having to be Brittany and because I'm still me. And then I have all this shit to heal and it's all at the surface. It's very overwhelming. And the shame sometimes exacerbates the cycles of um, trauma in a way. It makes it sort of so you continue to play out some of that toxicity and the same for me, like my shame. Of we've, we've connected our identities with that because that's the difference between shame and guilt. Shame is our identities attached to this thing we don't want to be attached to. Guilt is we don't like what we did, but that's mm. not who I am. Mm. So it's like I mm. know my... So, d- interesting. Yeah. So, so shame is... Say that again. Shame. Trying to process this. Shame is that you've connected your identity, your I am, to the things you don't want to be anymore. And guilt is feeling guilt bad for your behaviors. is just feeling bad for your behaviors, knowing that you're accountable to change them, but that's not who you are, and you know that. So you think guilt is healthier than shame? Yes, because there's action. Guilt, and because remember also Earl Partridge, the dying patriarch that is becoming aware of his own toxic masculinity, talks about regret. Regret. Mm-hmm. It's okay to regret. You regret. He regrets having been a womanizer to his mm-hmm. the love his, of his the life. love of his life. Lily. Did you notice all the women are named after flowers? We have Lily, <gasps> Rose. Well, I not all of them, that. but a number the ones, of the special ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think magnolia, a flower. I don't think that's a mistake. Mm-hmm. You know that there was this theme of women flowers that are you know. I think there's a lot of, in this film, what I really, one thing I really connected with, besides just the themes of love and seeing these toxic patterns playing out that I wanted to confront in my own life as a man, it's also just this idea of how beautiful the feminine impulse is, the creative, nurturing, um, soft, gentle, vulnerable, like the, the most beautiful, divine feminine qualities of the flower the gentle the gentle flower that creates and nurtures and to me that's true and that's what I wanted to cultivate in myself while also being a man and and um somehow still like intertwining weaving those the masculine with the feminine and it's just been such a challenge well I could say for me I start feeling like a flower (laughs) when I'll speak for me and maybe not for all women because I, I love my masculine Zach so much and I have blocks because of fear of, of what could be, but I, I love this man and no. I feel like a flower <laughs> with him. Um, I want him to pluck my flower. Mm. Mm. See, we <laughs> said we might go into some taboo subject matter. Mm-hmm. Bow chicka bow wow. But mm-hmm. I I feel that when I feel my emotions and my feelings are protected. It's not about him beating someone up for me. It's not about him getting in a fist fight, um, being an animal, a, a unhealthy animal, because um, animals are beautiful. But 
it's not about that for me, feeling protected or that he could kill the robber that came in the house. For me, it's when you protect my feelings and they matter to you, it's not that you take them on. It's not that you have to do what I say. It's that my feelings are protected. They matter. They're listened to. They're, there's validation. It's important to you. And there's action because masculine energy is action, yeah. forward movement. And when that happens and I feel validation, like I can speak like this really bothers me, this hurts. And when he's present with that, there's something in me that instantly relaxes like if he repeats back, I know this is what you're saying, and I know he's really meaning it, I instantly relax. It's not even no action taken except that you understand me. You got it. Even if nothing changed, it's just that you understand and it matters. A woman can feel safe and become the flower. And it's like, oh, my God. What's interesting as a man is how challenging that still is because yeah. it's what I don't always do. And... If sometimes if, and it's funny how it, it cycles with us. Yeah, we have because, some cycles. <laughs> because when you're not feeling protected, your emotions aren't feeling protected or understood or heard, it can bring that protective masculine out in you in a way that mm -hmm. you take, you're using your emotions to attack. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then I, I kind of close up even more mm -hmm. and more and you feel less safe and more using your emotions in that way and it makes and it's interesting I do I've noticed that like when I can just like be that love and listen it does turn things so I, sometimes it does feel like the fulcrum of of our healing is on me and it's a lot because I don't know how to do it always because I it's easy for me to feel hurt too and no and it's not all on you like I don't I don't know sorry I don't mean no. to I don't think it's all on you. I think you should be talked to with respect. And I get so, I have a lot of trauma. So like it builds up in me, if I haven't rested and eaten right, it builds up so big that it wants to get out like a force. And if I feel he's not paying attention to me or it's not being understood or, or it's not important to him and there's no action being taken on it that shows importance that, hey, my woman is hurting and I don't want her to hurt anymore. So how can we meet in the middle and fix this? I feel like it's not important and I get more and more mad, but that gives me no right. It, it's just so frustrating because I just like, it's just it's sometimes validation is just being listened to and heard and like trying to connect to it. Cause then like solutions will pop up in a man's mind. Okay, this crazy woman's feeling all this illogical shit. So, <laughs> This will solve everything. Boom. Okay. Is, are you happy with that woman? Cool. Like, and then she's like, oh my God, he heard me. Oh, like it could be, okay. She wants more time with me. Hey, do you want to go to dinner tonight? Oh, instantly we're like, he heard me. Oh, I feel so safe with him. You know, it's, and, but I attack you. I become the masculine and I try to protect myself against you and it shuts you down more. Yeah. And we repeat it over and over and over again. And what's interesting is, so this podcast, folks, was originally about the wedding business, and it will end up being about love and telling stories of love for our couples, but also it's about telling our story of love, and we want to tell as many different kinds of stories of love, of, of love as we can, and I just had this instinct that that this podcast could be a way for us to talk in a healthy way that will sort of bring out that flower in you that will allow me to sort of confront some of these things because, you know, part of making a podcast public and talking about this is we're all, we are wanting to be of ourselves, so it's allowing us to kind of talk in a way that we maybe don't always find easiest to do. We have mouth chastity belts on filters we have our our best sunday best on ladies and gentlemen as soon as we get off fuck you it's hassle. really healthy I, I feel it's healing here talking about this it like, is it really is and, and yeah. watching that film mm -hmm. yeah you know about all of these themes of how hard it is to find a real genuine love between men and women um i really i, I don't know i just feel really like this is guided not to get all mm -hmm. it is guided woo and Talking I like about your woo. 
fate and all these things, but it does feel like a bit of a download that, that, that we started with a film like that, talking about some real vulnerable stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's epic. It's it some was epic. epic. It's is some that epic an, love. Is that not an epic film? And, it was and epic. That, was that, that not, is the title epic. I mean, like a No, if epic I'm crying film, in it, really my brave. stone cold heart is crying. Um, I, it's, we were both we sobbing. Were, we were both sobbing next to each other, holding hands like an old married couple. It was couple. really beautiful. It was beautiful because like, I got to see, it wasn't just like, not to call you out, Zach. No. Like it was like, it wasn't, I could feel him. We're very in tune with each other's energies, very in tune. Which can and, be part of the problem sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I could feel his pain and like his frustration and all the pain he's working through that he wishes wasn't there. And I got Shame to, as a man. Yeah. And it's just like. It's like when you love someone, you if you think you've forgotten you love someone, when they go through pain, you remember. Yeah. I just wanted to get a straw and suck it all up out of them. <laughs> you wanted to suck it all out of me, folks in podcast land. I you hate when you to... hurt. That's no matter how mad I am, when I when you go, I'm hurt, I instantly go to my feminine comes out and I'm yeah. just like Mm -hmm. nurturing like oh I just want to cuddle you like no yeah I don't I don't want you to hurt so yeah it was nice we both connected this movie of of pain from whatever memories cuz both of us don't want to call our parents out mm -hmm. neither one of us wants to um, I mean we love our families no we love our families we want relationships some toxic programming that's been passed down they and and that's that's where we find forgiveness is hurt people do hurt people mm -hmm. but a lot of times we bypass the anger part the mm -hmm. the people who were good people we mm -hmm. feel guilty for being angry and it's like no for me mm -hmm. for me at least I and when I met you you called me out on this yeah you were like your relationship with anger isn't I don't think it's you know it wasn't healthy mm -hmm. I felt so much Which I guilt. had a trajectory with having a mm -hmm. toxic relationship with anger myself. Yeah, and for me, I years. never got angry until yeah. I met Zach. <laughs> wow. <laughs> is this a good thing, you guys? Is this okay? Is, I is feel this... sorry for you, but it's been very... Imagine an emotion that's actually healthy. When, like you've always told me, is when it's when it's properly merged with love, anger is very healthy. And imagine yeah. taking it away completely. How mm -hmm. much that's manifests in illness within mm -hmm. me and things. Like, and so I meet you, and you say it's okay. You're safe, Brittany. Mm -hmm. Like as a woman, I'm like, yeah. you're safe to be angry. And then I'm like, okay. And then I couldn't turn it off mm -hmm. because it's, because I was I did I did like that I liked you to be able to. Thirty express years. these things like I knew somehow on some intuitive level that you needed to mm -hmm. get these emotions out 35 years of suppression and unfortunately especially when you love someone god there's a whole I feel the shame right now it all has been dumped on him and my children the people you feel safest with that you also feel the unsafest with which is ironic um I've dumped it on him and I don't know how to turn it off sometimes because I'm it's I've been running from it. And so I'm so lucky he's been so supportive. Um I think if we saw that couple in the movie, um Claudia and the police Jim. Jim, like they I could see her when they move in together having some anger spells. I love to actually think about the characters after the film. It's a fun a fun game. Oh yeah, you know she was doing the shit I do to you. Yeah. Like I can't trust you. No, you're too sweet. For at least a year. At least a year. But I bet he got the best sex he's ever had. That man, I have well, to. Well, that's I for bet. sure true. <laughs> <laughs> Some real crazy wild. He's gonna be like, oh, gee that D. golly, gee golly. Uh, uh, is oh, this man. okay with Christ? Is this okay? I gotta go do it. Oh, Father Sons. <laughs> she just, she, I just, I just smacked her ass. Oh my God, <laughs> I feel so bad. She's bringing out his wild animal. Yeah. No, I would just say, like you, you talked about your, your being ashamed of like, you know, certain the, parts the, of of sexuality of yeah. you know the more gentle side, which is beautiful. But I also understand how that that more like 
persona of um, we have names. It's Mr. Wolf and Baby Bunny, mm. and Mr. We're Wolf. We're getting into it. Yeah, Mr. Wolf. When we role play, he is that masculine dominator, and Baby Bunny is one where, where I feel safe to be the female. It's the only the place, flower. The flower. I'm just realizing that that's the only place I feel safe to be my feminine fully. Is in that dynamic. In that dynamic. That's that so That sexual weird. dynamic. Yeah. No wonder I want sex all the time because I'm wanting to be feminine. Mm. Jesus. Why does this have to happen in front of you guys? Although I think it's such a beautiful thing that it is happening in front of everyone here in podcast land. Yeah, but Zach. On our inaugural episode. Good. Yeah, yeah, no. I'm he's, a good guy. Oh, is that yeah, what you mean? yeah, you're a good guy. Is that not what you mean? No, he's also a good guy. I was saying. Are you saying, are you talking about some taboo things that we. I was just saying, like, if you, gentlemen, if you need a a book on the honeymoon night, how to please your woman, um, you know, after the wedding. Um, Zach, because in his essence, he's so safe and loving. But then you have this guy who, like, takes control mixed in with that safe energy that you know your heart's protected and that he is the last thing on his he would ever do is hurt you and when he does he actually hurts himself in unhealthy ways like probably emotionally because it's the last thing he wants to do is not protect me so you get into these worlds of dominance and the taboo nature of things and you have a healthy male dominating dominating you in whatever way you please me i like it rough and um i We're love really it going in yeah. On, our, on the first episode, we so were talking saying, about some S and M uh, themes here. I think already, which I'm glad that we're doing this on a on a on a wedding or a uh, you know our uh, you know what you're getting into when you asked me. No, no, it's see, lo- I, love I, had, it. I, want, I had another podcast. I want podcast. it to be a different uh, <laughs> a different kind of podcast about about love and marriage. I want it to be a little spicy. Not that we're married. We'll but. have to have a team meeting on little, so I know mm. not to talk about the big things. Oh, dear. <laughs> You're going to make me oh, bashful. Oh, gee golly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim Curran coming out there. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Well, Midwestern <laughs> ah, shucks. Ah. I'm, I don't know. I think it's the rebellious nature trying to get him to blush. I feel, <laughs> am I blushing? Hmm? No. Am I? Um, hopefully I'm I get blushing. some spankings later for being so bad. Oh, dear. I like the sounds of all this. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Is Hail this, uh, Mary one. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, this is great. I, 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 I wanted it to be about all these things. Have we stayed on topic? I mean, so here's the thing. Is there any way we can bring this back to the film? Because so a beautiful f- film about um, cycling male trauma that um, is very old and primitive, that's what been programmed into people, our culture. What advice would we give them? People, like, what are we doing to get out of these cycles ourselves? It's interesting, in the film, so this didn't get recorded, this was part of what was uh, lost in our in our SD card mishap on our first episode. Wah, wah. I know, there's a button for wah, wah, wah. Do it, do I, it. I don't know which one it is, oh. because I think we have it, but soon we'll have some weird... <laughs> so fun, fun with podcasting, fun with audio. I think it's here. It is. Here's a sad trombone. Magnolia. So, bringing it back to Magnolia, if we can here, um, a beautiful film um, that changed changed the trajectory of my life, um, and. Um, I don't know, made me want to be a more, a less toxically masculine, but still masculine um, presence. Um, How can we, how can we? Did you see how bad Claudia needed that? That's what I noticed. I related to her. How he still needed, she still needed the uh, masculine. She gave up on it, like. And then she wasn't expecting to meet him Mm -hmm. and was like, I think like whether I can't speak for everyone else. I've wanted that. I've been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. 
even though it's scary. Yeah. I think she was waiting for him. Someone who still is masculine. So she could finally not be scared hiding in her apartment. A more divinely masculine presence. Right. I feel like their story is the sympathetic, hopeful story mm-hmm. in the film that like we end on that story. You know, we end on the hope of Jim Curran coming in and listening to Claudia in a vulnerable way, but still as a man. Changing the whole story, I mean, it seems like we know that, that that's going to end the toxic cycle. It's our decisions yes. that ends the cycles with a choice. It's not that it feels that's good. Beautiful. It's not that it, yeah, it's not that it feels okay. It's not that your body's screaming at you, no, run. Yeah, my body's screaming that, but I'm going to make a different decision. And then you get evidence over time and you heal and you can breathe a little bit more every day. Like in our relationship, it's like we go through waves. Like, I, yeah. oh, this is good. This is good. Oh, fuck. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, this and is good. it drops good. us down. And we then when we're dropped down into to the cycles of trauma again, it gets so scary and it gets so mm. hard to see yourself out of a, a seeming hell situation sometimes yeah. when we start spiraling on the, on the trauma again. And it's... Yeah, because I want to leave constantly, and I throw it in his face. I'm like, I'm leaving. I can see her doing that. Yeah. I'm leaving. I'm out. That's I'm going to happen, by the way. Totally. In the story, totally. After this ends, she, 100%. She fucking slams that door in his face, leaves. I know you alluded to that, but. Yeah, totally. She leaves many, many times, and he's just sitting there, and then she's probably beating herself up yeah. like I do with you, because the more she's mean, the more she knows in her heart he's not like those men. And she's just pushing him away and pushing him into a more probably toxic masculinity. But not that it's her fault because he could always make a decision. And I, f- I actually feel like he's he would always make that decision to be the more divine masculine. And I actually think I think they end up okay. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, I, I do. I think they make it through the, through the tra- trauma. I think they confront their trauma like you and I will. <laughs> yeah. And that we are. And like this podcast is... Apart, I feel I feel this happening. Yeah, for all you listeners out there in podcast land, we are sort of putting our relationship out there for you to hear sort of the real picture of what's happening, not just the pretty picture. It might yeah. have sounded you might have thrown up in your mouths a few times hearing the sweet stuff, like but this really, movie. it's ugly. It, like it the wasn't movie. Uh, this rom com that I like. It wasn't my beloved sleep, sleep, uh, Sleepless in Seattle. Yes, which we will talk about some of these fun rom coms too sometimes. But I'm saying yeah. it's like our relationship. We were painted. If it doesn't look like those, yes. it's not healthy. Yes, this movie, Magnolia. Yes. This is love. This is what you guys are living in in the Western fucking culture. This is what when we all are. This we is all the water are. We swim in. This is the water we swim in. This is reality. And these are the toxic cycles we have yes. to break. And it's not pretty. You're going to hurt each other and you're going to have to hang tight and start listening and communicating yes. and, and trying to not beat yourself up when because you don't it's do it in perfect. All of us. All of this us. This is still in us. We've come out of a very dark time in humanity. Mm-hmm. And we're, some of us are, many of us are starting to wake up in the younger generations and you can see hope for humanity, but it's still so, this programming is still so in all of us. Yeah. I think the younger generations just accepted that's not who we are. We're going to feel and we're going to not really respect time because we are in the moment, we do what we want and that can go to an extreme, but with the millennials and the Gen X's, like, I think the hard part for us is we're recovering. That's right. We're at a weird transitional point from, like, the boomers still have a lot of that toxicity, a mm-hmm. lot of that closed off to emotion and stuck in the trauma. And I think we're at this interesting point where we didn't come into this world at a time when it was completely okay and safe to be completely vulnerable the way yeah. it's easier for, I think, some of the Zoomers and the millennials, well, younger millennials and Zoomers to do, mm-hmm. we're sort of at this fulcrum point of things where, as Eddie Gilman would say, if you're listening out there, mm-hmm. Mr. Eddie Gilman, um, the baton passers. He talks about the cultural baton passers. Um, I think we took the hits. Mm-hmm. I think we went through the battlefield to go against the grain. We have to process the trauma for the collective. I think mm-hmm. we're doing a lot of processing, Yeah. you know, well, and I want to just say, like, if you're going to do this processing in a relationship, just watch 
this movie and get a realistic viewpoint and stop preaching out there that it should be this way or that way because like relationships rather because it's not pretty when you've been through trauma you've been molested or you've been emotionally abused as a child you find the person you love and you don't always just feel peace you feel terror and it's not just any terror it's a nightmare it's it's the weirdest paradox you meet the man in your dreams but you're living in a hell so this movie is just like more of a realistic portrait of like you know, it's like the little kid in the movie. I mean, his dad was so hard on him. And, you know. Stanley. Stanley. Mm-hmm. He was so hard the on Stanley. Genius. And then interesting, like, mm. with Donnie, Quiz Kid Donnie Smith. Yeah. I, 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 his character, the more I watch this film, resonates with me. Just, like, a, such a sweet character that has so much love to give and doesn't know where to put it. To me... Mm. It's so heartbreaking. He describes love, remember, in the bar as like love is a bunch of like nerves in acid on fire. That's what love is. You remember him saying like yeah. it's like a bunch of nerves and that's that's and it's okay. And that's that's what my love is. And to me, that's what love feels like oftentimes. Scary, mm-hmm. violent almost. Yeah. Um like like a, like nerves in a bucket of acid. It is. It's like when people are like, love is peaceful. It's like, okay, if it's something new, though, our bodies are designed to reject it. Yeah. We're only accepting the familiar. If all you've known is pain and rejection and unacceptance, then love and acceptance comes in. Do you think that's going to feel great? No, because we need to learn to love ourselves, which is the cliche Oprah um, dictum. Hi, Oprah. That is really, I think, sometimes cliches are cliches because they're true. And yeah. it seems cheesy sometimes to talk about them, so I'm sorry, y'all. But, see, I'm a Georgian. I've, I've, I've moved from Michigan. Oh, my God. And uh, I'm saying finished. y'all now. Oh, my God. Isn't this she great? She loves it. I do. I've got kind of turned on. No, I don't want to. I kind of like your Yankee. She I calls like me it. a Yankee because I'm from the North, which I don't know if there's some Mason-Dixon kind of uh, Confederate Union old... Uh, the Yankees talk different, and I don't care if you're above... I'd say if you're in Virginia and up, you're a Yankee, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. Above you, the Mason-Dixon line. Okay. That's what oh. the historical... Uh, you're so smart. Shh, no. <laughs> don't tell anyone. He's, he's doing a with his hand he's, he's drawing the line out do you guys no, speak you're like mm. you're it's like, a little bit so that's one of the problems we have in the relationship is she has this sweet georgian southern bell charm and she talks talk about how i'm so like handsome. a magnolia and he comes in get out of here you're ridiculous and i'm like I get a little <gasps> insensitive with my but i don't think he's ins- i think you're just talking your language of your yeah, people of my people your people, yeah, we, we got nothing about that today. But, like, no, I know you just start speaking how you're used to speaking, and then everyone here is so delicate, usually. And so... Which every- I love. It is starting to change me in a really beautiful way, being here. And he's... I'm changing and getting a bit more direct, which yeah. is funny. The Yankee... Sometimes the Yankee comes out in you, the, the like, northern... Wait, come back. Come back. <laughs> so this was, I think, a really fun foray into podcasting what do you think Brittany? hey i enjoyed it was it good for it was good for it you it was good for me oh man it was good for me and uh it was really fun to watch the film with yeah, you yeah i'm glad you shared this with me and i can see why it changed your life in so many different ways of inspiration watch the film you guys i don't yeah. think we actually said anything in the in the in the version that we lost i think there were a few spoilers we have we've been careful to not Talk about any of the Frogs? Charles Fortian themes. <laughs> wow, she, she went there, ladies <laughs> and germs. But there was a lot of Char- Charles Ford. I don't think I think that got lost on the on the cutting room floor when we when we lost that SD card. But there's themes of Charles Charles Fort and the supernatural mm-hmm. that are woven through in a really cool. He was a very interesting, um, really scientifically minded thinker exploring some of these supernatural, you know, crazy things that honestly, look it up, frogs falling, 
There's uh, this is scientifically corroborated. Um, science has weird explanations about weather, and it doesn't really make any sense. No one can. It's a rare phenomenon, the the raining frogs. Where do but they this come actually from? Exists. No one really knows. Science talks about like weather sucking them up into certain vortexes and dropping them. That's how science explains the rain of frogs. It sounds um, like science. But like Charles Fort was exploring all those kinds of weird synchronous things. Like I remember in the beginning, there were all those crazy stories that were like, you know, the the son, the suicidal son whose parents argued. That was one of the craziest ones to me. And like that was nuts. They always argued, and and she always pulled a shotgun out. Uh, the wife and you know his mother, and he he basically loaded the gun, knowing their tendency to fight. And um, right as he's committing suicide, this is real. This is like a real story. It's wild. So like he jumps off of a building to commit suicide. As they're fighting, she's wielding the the loaded shotgun that he loaded. For them to kill each other because he couldn't take the arguing anymore and as he's trying to commit suicide as he's passing the window in which you know they live in um as he jumps to his own death tries to commit suicide uh the shotgun accidentally goes off that he loaded for them to kill and it hits him and it turns this unsuccessful suicide into a homicide as he's passing mm-hmm. and had he not loaded the gun, uh, he wouldn't have actually died because there was a, a net installed for painters or window washers or something right below him. So he actually wouldn't have died. Uh, the net would have caught him. And uh, it's just these kinds of something weird just, karmic synchronicities. I How does that happen? Something just came to me. Change is inevitable. Yeah. These cycles will break. Yeah change a different decision will happen whether we like it or not and we're all interconnected through our minds we do things automatically um and we think that we're just doing it but we're going through a time it's, maybe on this planet when change is, is inevitable changes and we're, these cycles are going to break whether we like it or not and we're just and, here at a time when and it's these happening. ideas we have in our head we think mm-hmm. they're just from they're just constructed by us i think these ideas come to us sometimes to break these cycles and yeah, I won't get it all into I that love it. but we're getting so fucking woo here I know we're supposed to be wrapping it up we are like, supposed to be wrapping it up but this is kind of a, a great fun movie. part what a great movie how about that <laughs> bless your end heart it, end it with that uh, we fucking had a good time in this podcast yeah and uh, we want to thank all of all of you for um, you know who we don't know if there's going to be an all of you but there could very well be a few of you and uh and uh being there on our journey here together our twin flame journey that there's gonna be more talked about um, on future podcasts we might talk about aliens we might talk about the pleiadians and the mantis beings and, and then some couples getting married right and their stories of love we want to talk about not just woo not just wild not just taboo but also just our couples who are getting married and um also like just things like like my husband my original like i've been married one time he passed away so we're going to get into some of the shadow sides of love that we don't the things i'm rejecting i just want the fluffy unicorn oh, as zach said we can, actually the grave site is two miles up the road we should oh, wow we, we should, should visit that for an episode yeah we'll do some woo and, but anyway we don't have an outro planned um i think we're gonna do this first episode without an outro but you know, follow us at Epic Love Wedding Films on Instagram and Facebook. Follow Brittany Epic Love Wedding Hair and Makeup on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we're probably going to have a Matrimony Moni YouTube channel when we start taping our, our um, hopefully not too self conscious mugs. Um, you can see what we look like as we talk uh, about blowjobs. Not just. <laughs> I, <they're laughs> I love doing this too. I mean, he's not right. I'm a little bashful talking about blowjobs here. Um, don't so worry, excited. we're not gonna we're not gonna turn this into the into a, like a a, a porno um, podcasts, but we might yeah, talk about it. Me. 
So anyway, thank you for 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 listening uh, on this inaugural episode of Matrimony Money. I might make an outro here uh, in post because I'm not good on this unit, but for now, um, thank you to all of you in podcast land for listening, and we're out this bitch. Peace out. <laughs> That's fun. Thank you.